When an uncrewed rocket malfunctions during launch, it's the job of the range safety officer to make sure that it blows up so it doesn't go out of control and land somewhere dangerous. But what happens if you have people on your rocket? That's where the launch escape system comes in. I'm going to explain what this is and show you how it works using a spaceflight simulator called Reentry. I'm going to give a quick overview of launch escape systems and then we'll jump into the fun part and launch these rockets in re-entry so we can see them in action. Just quickly, most of you watching are not subscribed, so please like, comment and subscribe if you're enjoying this and you're learning something, it really helps me out. The first launch escape system, or LES, was used in the Project Mercury capsule in 1959, designed by Maxime Faget. It should be pretty obvious why you'd want such a system. You've got crew sitting on top of thousands of tons of rocket propellant. If things start to go badly, you want to get your crew to safety. This LES would either trigger automatically or be activated by the commander. There are three main types of launch escape system, liquid and solid propellant rocket motors and ejector seats. More recently, there is a trend towards swapping out solid motors for liquid motors. Solid rockets have a more simple design and are more efficient than liquid rockets, but once turned on, they can't be turned off. This makes them great for booster rockets where you can use them all up at once and drop them, but not so good for main engines and upper stages. It's also fine for LESs, but the downside comes in reduced control. A key advantage of a liquid LES over a solid LES is that you can abort at any stage during the launch. And you can control your attitude and how much thrust to apply. Solid LESs, like Mercury, Apollo, Soyuz, and Shenzhou, are mounted on towers above the capsule, and liquid LESs, like the SpaceX Crew Dragon capsule, Boeing Starliner, and Blue Origin's New Shepard, are built into the bottom or side of the capsule. You could also visualize this difference as being a pulling force, in the case of a tower, and a pushing force in the case of an inbuilt system. The Orion crew vehicle, which will be used in NASA's Artemis program, aiming to put humans back on the moon, achieves control in a solid LES by opening and closing a series of valves to control the direction of thrust. LESs would subject the crew to a force of 14 to 17 times the force of Earth's gravity for a few seconds. Fighter pilots will typically get up to a force of around 9G, so this is pretty substantial. There have only been a few cases of an LES being used outside of testing. A Mercury Redstone mission in 1960 ended with the escape system unintentionally blasting off without the crew capsule. During a 1966 Soyuz launch, the LES engine was accidentally fired, which resulted in an explosion that tragically killed one pad worker. A 1983 Soyuz launch cleared the crew from the rocket on the pad as it caught fire, saving them both. In 2018, another crewed Soyuz capsule separated from the launch vehicle after booster rockets failed to separate at 50 kilometers into the launch. And in 2022, an uncrewed New Shepard flight suffered a booster engine failure one minute into the launch, and the LES cleared the capsule. Notably, the Space Shuttle didn't have an LES due to its design making it infeasible to have one for all crew. Space Shuttle Columbia had ejection seats in its testing phase, but they were removed later because they would only allow for two of the crew to eject. After the 1986 Challenger disaster, the rest of the Space Shuttles were designed to allow crew to evacuate through the main ingress-egress hatch and parachute to safety. They would clip onto this three meter long pole that would extend out the door and then slide down. This would give them a bit of clearance from the shuttle before being in freefall. This escape system would only work when the space shuttle was in a controlled glide, and notably, it wouldn't work on takeoff, or at least you'd have to transition from takeoff to a controlled glide at around 20,000 meters. It also wouldn't be instantaneous like other LESs, and it wouldn't have saved the crew of Challenger or Columbia. It would have rather limited use, even compared to the Gemini ejector seat, which we'll talk about soon. The Mercury LES, which we'll look at in the simulator first, is jettisoned around two minutes into launch. Let's look at some footage of the Mercury LES being used. One last thing I want to point out here before we go to the simulator is the position and orientation of the motors here. You'll note that they're pointing sideways a little. Well, that's because directly underneath the motors, you've got the crew in their capsule and they don't want to be cooked. This angle reduces the efficiency somewhat and is again another advantage of pusher systems. Well, here we are in the Mercury capsule, sitting on top of a Redstone rocket, which uh, would take us into a suborbital flight, uh, unlike the Atlas rocket, which the Mercury is also flown with, uh, which would be used to get the capsule into a full orbit. Now, of course, on top, we can see this lovely launch escape tower with its three solid, uh, solid rocket engines. Now, just over two minutes into launch, this would automatically detach and fly off from the capsule. Uh, but in the event of an emergency, the commander or the only crew member could uh, manually engage that to detach their capsule from the rest of the rocket and pull away to safety. So we've got just over four minutes to launch. 
Uh, let's go ahead and go through our pre-flight checklist. It's pretty short for this one, I've got it memorized. First step is to uh, press launch control to ready. What that means is when the time to launch gets to zero, this rocket will automatically take off. Um, but if you don't do that, it won't. Arm the squib, arm auto retro. And we want to ensure that we're on UHF. Good, and just do a quick radio check. Excellent, read you five by five on the UHF. From there, there's not much to do but to wait, but if we wanted to engage the launch escape system, uh, pretty much everything in this game is clickable, which is pretty cool, and you can interact with uh, just about anything that you could interact with on a, on a rocket. Uh, the only exception to that seems to be anything to do with the joysticks, which you would control by the keyboard instead. Now, the launch escape system for the Mercury capsule was controlled, activated by the commander on that left joystick. You would uh, push down a button on top and rotate the joystick to the left and that would engage the launch escape system. The uh, visual for this is a little bit different in the game but uh, hopefully I've got a picture here showing you what it would look like in real life. Um, but no matter, we can still activate it by pressing Control shift z Well, with our pre-launch checklist complete, let's go ahead and speed up time and take off. 15 seconds to launch. Umbilical, disconnect, and we are away. Beautiful. From inside, make sure the clock has started, and we can go ahead and radio that down to command. Now, during the initial stage of the, the launch, well, in fact, during the entire launch, there's nothing for us to do other than to just keep an eye on things and monitor all of our gauges, and if something doesn't look right, we can abort manually. Otherwise, uh, assuming the launch goes well, there's pretty much not much for the commander to actually do. Keep an eye on that cabin pressure, make sure it slowly goes down to 5.5, but no lower. Keep an eye on that temperature, make sure it's not too high, too low, and so on. If we take a look from outside, we'll see that we're starting to angle downrange a little bit to head east over the ocean here. Um, now, we're about one minute into launch here. Uh, we have until about two minutes and ten seconds before that tower automatically disconnects, because that would be the point at which it is too high to be of any effective use anyway. So let's say something's not quite looking right, pressure is looking low or something. We're going to go ahead and just uh, press down that top button, twist that joystick to the left, and this is what happens. We just disconnect and fire off. And that launch tower should disconnect there. Yep, there you go. So that would have uh, put us through about 14 to 17 uh, G force, uh, 14 to 17 times the force of Earth's gravity. Uh, not too insignificant. Our capsule is automatically um, putting us in a retrograde position with the bottom or the engine uh, at the bottom of this capsule um, facing the direction that we're going, which is up right now. So it's going to be a little while before uh, we can speed up time a little bit. Um, but we're obviously still going up, so we have to finish our parabolic arc here, our suborbital flight, uh, before we can... Uh, safely land. Now our retro rockets just disconnected there. Uh, from here, unfortunately we can't speed up time, so we'll just chill for a little bit. Looks like we're starting to get to our peak of our uh, parabolic trajectory there. Um, not too much to do from here. Uh, if we wanted to, we could turn up the air conditioner a bit for re-entry, but I suspect it's not going to be that hot of a re-entry. We didn't really get that high, didn't really get that fast. Um, but the, the drogue parachute will automatically deploy, the main parachute will automatically deploy, the landing bag will automatically deploy. Uh, so again, just keep an eye on everything and sit back and enjoy the ride. So the drogue parachute deploys automatically at about 23,000 feet. 
Uh, the scope, I believe, has already been automatically retracted, which is what we would use to see through this bottom camera here. And here we go, dropping altitude quickly. We're at 80,000 feet. Everything looks fine. Temperature looks uh, nice and cool. Suit temperature looks nice. Maybe a little bit on the warm side, so I'll just uh, turn up that suit temperature air conditioner a little bit more. And there we go, it's dropping nicely. Okay, how are we looking? Getting close to deploying that drogue parachute, uh, but we're not going that fast. Uh, this this view, I have a feeling, <laughs> doesn't really feel accurate. We are, we're supposed to be at 23,000 feet, but it doesn't look like it. Anyway, there's the drogue parachute deploying. Uh, drogue parachutes... Oh, I can uh, ignore that, O2 emergency. Drogue parachutes, uh, they're used when you're going very fast to slow you down a little bit, uh, and then usually you'll jettison that one and deploy your main parachute. So it serves a it serves an important but different role to regular parachutes. Main parachute should deploy in a sec, at which point the, there we go, drogue gets disconnected and flies off in the wind there. And then a second, there we go. You hear that lovely sound of the landing bag deploying. That is pretty much it. So now we chill and wait for us to land. It's it's very slow for this final stage of the descent in this game. So um, we'll just pretend that everything happened nicely. We splashed down and that ship came over and uh, rescued us and pulled us out of this cap capsule. The Gemini and Vostok capsules used ejector seats with personal parachutes instead of a typical LES. The Gemini aboard would have had the two crew get ejected out the side of the capsule in their chair, where they would then parachute to the ground. I say would have, because this was never used in a launch. An ejection seat in Gemini feels like a weird backtrack from the abort tower that Mercury used. There are a few reasons for this move, but the most interesting one is that initially NASA planned for the Gemini capsule to deploy a self-inflatable wing, called a regalo wing, after re-entry and land on a runway. If there were any issues during this final phase, the astronauts could just eject. They ended up cancelling this and backtracked to parachutes for landing the capsule, but the ejector seat remained. The ejector seat was also a simpler and lighter system overall. However, the ejector seats are only viable up to around 15 kilometers altitude, much lower than other LESs. Having said all that, after three years of testing by NASA, they wrote this report saying it was safe for use. I don't know why, but I find the wording of this conclusion kind of hilarious. The escape system described in this report is capable of providing safe escape. This system has been tested for the worst conditions in altitude and dynamic pressure using anthropomorphic dummies and, in certain areas, men. Well, I'm convinced. Let's test it out. Here we are now in the Gemini capsule. First thing you'll notice is I have a friend. It's a two-person capsule now. Second thing you might notice is it looks a bit more complicated in here, and you'd be right. So that's partly why we have two people. There's more going on, uh, more buttons and switches, and actually the uh, first capsule to have an onboard computer, as far as I'm aware. The uh, Mercury capsule certainly did not. A very primitive looking computer, and we'll turn that one on in a few moments to just to have a quick look outside. Uh, we're sitting on top of a Titan rocket here, and you'll notice there is not a launch escape system tower on top. Uh, because of course we have ejector seats. And ejector seats would be engaged using this little toggle here. You'd pull on that, and you'd go flying out the top of this capsule. That would open up, of course. Uh, and you'd be out of here. So, we're going to run through the uh, pre-flight checklist and take off and engage those parachutes. Engage our ejector seats. The pre-flight checklist is a little bit more complicated here and I don't have that mem memorized yet. So, I'm going to use this handy tool to help me. First thing to do is to turn on the main batteries. And fire up this computer. There we go. Look at this thing. Beautiful. PC has finished self-checking.
So next thing we do now, and this is very important, we have to wait for this to finish aligning. Uh, because if we don't, then our alignment will be off for the rest of the flight, which is not ideal. So uh, patience is the name of the game here. We're just going to patiently wait for this to definitely fully finish. Uh, even a small offset would be potentially catastrophic. But looks like... Uh, is that still moving? No, okay, I think I think we're good to go. Cool. Switch this computer to uh, mode 72. And that will uh, then when you press readout, that should display our velocity on takeoff as far as I understand. Do a quick radio check. Five by five, once again. Uh, and now we can rest. So we'll speed up time again. Now keep in mind that uh, with this particular launch escape system with the ejector seats, we only have a effective uh, altitude of ejection of about 20,000 meters. So we have to use a little bit earlier than we use the uh, the last one on the Mercury. And we have lift off. All right, we'll just get a little bit of altitude so we don't so we don't fly straight into the ground. Give our parachute some time to engage. All right, sudden angle down. So let's get out of here. Let's just, let's say things are going wrong. Not looking too good. Boom, we're out. I'm in my seat. I'm flying. <laughs> seat flies off, and my personal parachute will engage that uh, in just a second. That's automatic, by the way. In real life, I'm not sure if that's automatic, but uh, in the game it is. Bit of a tumble, but parachute, any second? Is that my parachute? What is that? I can't zoom out. Oh, there we, no, there we go. Okay, parachute's deployed. And then we just uh, gently fall to the ground, and maybe someone from that ship would come and save us. Hopefully uh, you don't land too far away from the land or the ship. We might be in trouble anyway. But there we go. Uh, probably my least favorite launch escape system out of any that I've seen, but if it saves your life, then it saves your life. Apollo had an emergency detection system which would automatically abort in the early stages of the flight, if required, so that they didn't have to rely on human reaction time. This system had three wires that ran down the length of the rocket. If two or three of those wires lost power, that would indicate that something had gone wrong, and the LES would automatically deploy. And finally, here we are inside the Apollo capsule. Uh, different again, we now have three crew in here. The commander seat being here on the left. And we are on top of a Saturn V rocket. Um, but we've got that uh, slightly different version, but that same classic back to the solid launch escape system tower. So once again, once you reach a certain altitude, that will automatically uh, eject and disconnect from the rest of the capsule, unless uh, it's either automatically triggered or the commander manually engages it. Again, this is a more complicated uh, capsule. A lot more going on, got an onboard computer again. Um, and the pre-flight check is even longer and more complicated, but uh, we've got this lovely tool that will help us with that. So let's go ahead and do that, take off, and see if we can get this launch escape system going.
Radio check is good. This uh, would certainly be easy with two other actual players sitting in here with me. I'm very excited for multiplayer for this game. Um, but having to jump back and forth across the cabin so often is a little bit annoying. Um, but certainly a really cool space flight simulator, which uh, gives you another aspect of space flight that games like Kerbal Space Program, uh, which, you know, are great, but wouldn't give you this kind of fine-grained detail of what the inside of a cabin would look like during launch. I would uh, give some more commentary here, but I'm kind of focusing, and this is the definitely the capsule that I'm least familiar with. I'm going to go ahead and push and hold that until FDAI2 is equal to FDAI1. FDA uh, I don't know what either of those things are, but I'm just going to hold that for a little bit and hope that that uh, does what it needs to do. Uh, yeah, being the most complicated capsule, there are a lot of lessons on you can do in this game, tutorials on how to uh, how to fly this thing properly. Uh, I just know how to follow the checklist for this one. All right, that'll do. All right, just get our launch checklist there. Uh, now, I believe if we wanted to uh, engage the Lodge Escape system, this would have to be switched to CCW. Um, but we won't do that until launch. So 20 minutes to spare, plenty of time left. Uh, let's go ahead and just speed up time again. All right, 20 seconds. T minus 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. 12. 11, 10, and you notice this nine, uh, this one, this launch escape system has the cap on top, which protects five, the four, crew from the heat. Two, one, if uh, zero, if this were to engage during the launch, we there we go, lift off on top of this lovely Saturn V rocket. All right. Let's say something's going wrong already, it's falling apart. Now, sometimes, uh, most of the time, you'd hope that this would automatically engage the launch escape system. Uh, but I suppose that it hasn't in this particular case. So we'll just rotate this, if I can click it. So there we go. And we have separation. Ah, <laughs> beautiful. That's the first time I've managed to do that one <laughs> on the Apollo. Lovely. So yeah, that fires away a little bit, and then it will disconnect here automatically. Thank you, the protective heat capsule is off, and that thing is just Standby flying off into the Bravo. distance. Uh, Mark, one Bravo. One Bravo. Beautiful. Now, uh, unlike the Mercury capsule, which I'm a bit more familiar with, which automatically runs through its uh, final systems, like parachute, on its way down, I don't know what's going to happen here with the Apollo. Good at one minute. Someone just came off, was that a parachute? No, there was some... Oh, hey, there we go, parachute, it's beautiful. Okay, that automatically engages, thankfully. If you want to learn more about abort systems, I recommend this video by The Everyday Astronaut. It's about five years old now, but it's still a very good overview. So what do you think about all this? What's your favorite launch escape system, and would you be willing to use one? Let's keep the conversation going in the comments, and stick around and subscribe if you want to see more videos about space, science, and ethics. If you'd like to support me to make more of these videos, rather than looking for gainful employment, please consider making a contribution to my Buy Me A Coffee page, which is linked in the description. That's it. Bye!